colleagues, thank you for joining me again in the virtual press briefing from the Presidential Palace in Jakarta. First of all, I would like to inform you that last night, Jakarta time, elections were held at the UN headquarters in New York for members of the UN Security Council, ECOSOC, and the President of the General Assembly. Indonesia is one of the candidates for ECOSOC, and Alhamdulillah, Indonesia was elected as a member of ECOSOC for 2021-2023. With this mandate, Indonesia will work hard with other members of ECOSOC and the wider international community to accelerate economic and social recovery post-COVID-19. For three years in a row, Indonesia has been elected for the UN Security Council 2019-2020, UN Human Rights Council 2020-2022, and ECOSOC 2021-2022. I would like to take this opportunity to convey my appreciation for the support of the UN member countries. Colleagues from the media, the global COVID-19 pandemic has created adverse impact to the employment sector. The ILO estimates post-COVID-19 around 1.6 billion workers in the informal economic sector risk losing their job. This is almost half of the global work, work force. Sorry. Furthermore, young people are most at stake, with one in six people aged 18 to 29 out of jobs since the onset of the, since the, onset of the pandemic. In the wake of this global concern, the Government of Indonesia has introduced a series of incentives to support the socio-economic welfare, as well as to protect workers' rights. Furthermore, effort to promote a safe and supportive working environment that respects strict mandatory health protocol has also been a priority. In this context, I'm pleased that my colleague, Ibu Ida Fozia, Minister of Manpower is joining me today and Minister Fauzia will elaborate more on managing the impact of COVID-19 for employment sector. And as always, I'm also joined by Professor Wiku Adi Sasmito today. Colleagues, it has been a full week with Indonesia international bilateral engagement covering issues related to COVID-19, economic cooperation, as well as peace and security. I would like to update some of those issues. First is the Palestine issue. On Tuesday, 16 of June, I conversed with Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestine refugee in the Near East, or we call it UNRWA. The Commissioner General appreciated the continued support of Indonesia to UNRWA, not only political, but also financial support. Aside from congratulating him on his new appointment as Commissioner General, I reaffirm Indonesia's support for continued work of UNRWA to better address the refugee humanitarian situation. In this regard, we spoke about the need to build a more effective and efficient UN ROA, as well as effort to revitalize UN ROA through system-wide reform and improve management transparency. I reaffirm the Indonesia commitment on the continued funding for UN ROA. Several Indonesian humanitarian NGOs and philanthropists have also extended financial support for UN ROA. I also confirm Indonesia's participation 
in the upcoming UN Roa Extraordinary Virtual Ministerial Pledging Conference on the 23rd June 2020. On top of the financial support to UN Roa, Indonesia is also committed to extend financial assistance to Palestine through the government of Palestine. So on top of the UN Roa, we also channel our assistance directly to the government of the Palestine. The government of Indonesia is also committed to extend financial contribution to Palestine, Rakhine State and Afghanistan through ICRC. Colleagues, my second issue is on the Rakhine State issue. On Monday, 15 of June, I had a good long talk with the special envoy of the UN Secretary General on Myanmar, Ambassador Christine Burhaner, to discuss the latest situation in Rakhine State. The situation in Rakhine State remains alarming due to the security situation. Therefore, the plan of repatriation becomes more difficult. The humanitarian situation in Cox's Bazaar also needs more attention and the pandemic is making it even worse. These difficult circumstances will not stop our effort to render assistance to the people. Indonesia views that it is the right of the people to go back to go back to their homes to Rakhine However, repatriation should take place in a voluntary, safe and dignified manner. The special envoy appreciated Indonesia for the continued support rendered to the issue. The situation in Rakhine State was also one of the topic of discussion that I had over the phone with the Secretary General of ASEAN on the 12th of June 2020. ASEAN will not be able to start working on Comprehensive Need Assessment or CNA as long as the security situation remains challenging. Colleagues, for my third issue, yesterday, 17 of June, together with the Foreign Minister of Russia, I chaired the special ASEAN-Russia Foreign Minister's meeting on COVID-19. I also briefed the media about this yesterday actually, but let me say a few words why this meeting is important. As country coordinator for ASEAN-Russia partnership for 2018-2021, the meeting is significant due to the following points. First, ASEAN-Russia cooperation has established strong collaboration in the fight against COVID-19 as shown through implementation of tabletop exercise under the ASEAN Center for Military Medicine mechanism. It, take, it took place three weeks ago. And then training for medics in facing the pandemic and strengthening AS framework in dealing with COVID-19 by proposing leader statement on strengthening collective capacity in epidemics, prevention, and response. Second, ASEAN and Russia is committed to work together on the development and provision of vaccine and medicine. ASEAN-Russia collaboration is crucial to ensure accessibility and affordability for all countries, developed and developing, North and South, big and small. With Russia technological edge, ASEAN-Russia cooperation should be geared to ensure accessibility and affordability of vaccine and medicine to all countries. And third, ASEAN and Russia partnership has committed to strengthen regional health governance under ASEAN-led mechanism to prevent future pandemics. In realizing this goal, Russia could be an important partner to support 
the Regional Center for Disease Prevention, the COVID-19 ASEAN Response Fund through mobilization of the ASEAN-Russia Federation Dialogue Partnership, Partnership Financial Fund, and then the Regional Reserve for Medical Supplies and Capacity Building for Military Medicine. To this end, Indonesia will explore potential concrete joint project in addressing COVID-19. Colleagues, my next point is on the essential business travel bubble. Colleagues, discussion on the travel bubble arrangement are not taking place around the world. Many countries have begun discussion on travel bubble arrangement in a thorough, careful, and gradual manner. Health protocol is always key element in the discussion. And like other countries, Indonesia is now working to explore possibilities of having essential business travel bubble with a number of countries. We are holding talks with a number of countries right now, with thorough discussion on issues including scope of arrangement, term and condition, and for sure about health protocol. Before finishing, I would like to update you with the status of Indonesian returning per yesterday, per 17 June 2020. Colleagues, in a span of almost three months, started from 18 March until 17 of June, we recorded more than 110,000 Indonesian returning, or to be more exact, 114,587 returnees. This is an increase of 3.7% within a week or an additional of 4,130 people. This accumulative number consists of three categories, Indonesian in Malaysia, Indonesian crew, and self-repatriates. 83,035 Indonesian have returned from Malaysia so far. So we are seeing an increase of 2% from last week. 23,297 Indonesian crews have returned from 30 countries and arriving in Indonesia through five entry points in Jakarta and Bali. And this is a 7.2% increase compared to last week or an additional of 1,564 people. Furthermore, 8,255 Indonesian have returned home via self-repatriation from 49 countries which shows an increase of 13.1% this week or an additional of 956 people. This number also covers four Indonesian returning from South Korea and two Indonesian from Peru yesterday. Providing assistance to Indonesian abroad in need continues to be part of our priority. Between 18 March to 17 June, our Embassy, Consulate General and Consulate in Malaysia have distributed a total of 304,608 packages of basic needs. Indonesian diaspora in Malaysia also helped in contributing an additional 109,168 packages. Thus, in total, there are 413,776 packages distributed. Therefore, if we combine with the rest of the region, we manage to provide 481,940 packages 
globally. I believe I have conveyed all my points and now I would like to invite Minister Pozia to convey some ad updates according to her portfolio. Ibu Ida, kami persilakan. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow media partners, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us, salam, om swastiastu, namo buddhaya. The labor condition in Indonesia has been experiencing a positive trend before COVID-19, indicated by the decreasing unemployment rates to 4.9 in February 2020. This can be achieved by the government in collaboration with labor stakeholders to increase competency and productivity, maintaining conducive industrial relations and various programs to expand employment opportunities in the community. Furthermore, investment realization in the first quarter of 2020 with the potential to absorb more than 300,000 employment. We expect, expect that by the end of the year, enforced investment will continue to grow and increase workforce absorption. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has impact on our sectors of the economy and led to the employment sectors. Data compiled by Ministry of Manpower so that workers affected by COVID-19 in the formal and informal sectors has reached 1.7 million people. In addition to this data, we also anticipate additional unemployment to increase from 2.92 million to 5.23 million people. We are trying to reduce the unemployment rate so it will remain below two digits. According to the President Directive to address the impact of COVID-19 in the employment sector, there are six mitigation efforts, including first, economic stimulus for businesses to survive in pandemic so we can continue their business to retain their workers. Second, income tax incentive as well as credit interest exemption for workers in the formal sectors. Third, social safety net program through social assistance for formal and informal workers. Fourth, prioritizing pre-employment card for those being laid off. In this case, the Ministry of Manpower becomes an active partner of the pre-employment card program through the CISNACL platform. Fifth, the, intens the intensification of labor intensive and entrepreneurship program for employment. Six, median workers protection both in the country of the placement and after returning to the homeland. In line with these mitigation efforts, the Ministry of Manpower has set several strategies, including refocusing the budget and policies amendment to consider business sustainability and protection for workers. First, we continue to carry out competency and productivity based training through the COVID-19 response in vocational training centers programs. The participant not only gain skill from the training but also get post-training incentive. The vocational training has been involved for public kitchen and production centers for preventing the spread of COVID-19 by producing hand sanitation, PPE, masks, portable sinks, and processed food products. 
or fit pieces production are distributed for free to community affected by the pandemic. Second, the employment opportunities expansion program for workers affected by COVID-19 in the form of a labor intensive and entrepreneurial program. Third, we have also open information, consultation, and complaint services center for workers related to occupational safety and health in the company. To protect workers' rights on wages during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have issued the Handbook for Worker Protection and Business Sustainability. In addition, we have also issued a circular on workers' protection in the Occupational Incident Insurance Program in case of occupational disease due to COVID-19 exposures. This is to confirm that workers exposed to COVID-19 are in, entitled to health insurance protection. The government also encouraged an effective social dialogue with employers and trade unions and to collaborate in creating a conducive employment climate. On the other hand, to protect Indonesian migrant workers, the Ministry of Manpower has issued to decree of the Ministry of Manpower regarding to the temporary suspension in Indonesian migrant workers to place main countries. For prospective Indonesian migrant workers who filed to leave as well as Indonesian migrant workers who have returned home. The government facilitates them to participate in programs such as pre-employment card, competency-based training and labor-intensive and entrepreneurship program. The anticipate the Indonesian migrant worker placement during the new normal period, the Minister of Manpower and BP2MI preparing guideline for Indonesia worker migrant placement and protection management in new normal period in accordance with the ship in the situation in the placement country. To welcome the new normal, we also stipulate a policy to support sustainable, safe and productive business with COVID-19 transmission preventive protocol at workplace. Companies must develop business continuity planning and ensure the implementation of health protocol in conducting business activities through the COVID-19 pandemic period. With regard to labor sector recovery, the Ministry of Manpower has been focusing on first analysis of supply and demand dynamic in the labor sector as basis for policy making, especially for the preparation of competency training program adjusted to the emergence of business opportunities and new type of job in the, in the, in the COVID-19 era. Second, focus on big data development on employment that will be very useful for the increasing, increasingly dynamic policy preparation after the pandemic. The Ministry of Manpower currently maintain the Big Data Employment Platform called the Employment Information System or SISNACR. SISNACR will become the employment ecosystem to provide an integrated information ranging from job opening and type of certificates training to meet the needs of the job market. Hopefully, this platform will offer a solution to employment in general, access to increased reskilling and upskilling both for employers and for those affected by the pandemic, so they will raise again. Thank you for your kind attention and cooperation, stay healthy and be productive. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Fauzia. Uh, I will now proceed to the uh, Q&A session, and we have received questions from eight media, Nikkei, Voice of America, ABC News, Moroccan Press Agency, NHK, CNA, People, Daily, China, and Kyodo News. It seems that Minister Fauzia has included her response uh, to some questions related to her portfolio in her briefing. So after responding the question related to foreign policy issues, then I will directly invite Professor Biku to share some updates. So let me start responding some question related to foreign policy issue. On the question of Voice of America, in regard to the latest development of ventilators um, from the US, actually colleagues, I have answered this question in my previous briefing, uh, but I would like to repeat it again, that as I mentioned before, on the 4th of May, the U.S. aid in Jakarta has communicated with the Ministry of Health to identify the specification and other technical matters related to ventilators. And then on the 5th of May, so just one day after, the said information has been submitted to U.S. aid. The Indonesian Embassy in D.C. has also touched base with the U.S. Department of State, DOS, and the National Security Council, NSC, on this issue. Let me repeat that the U.S. ventilators are scheduled to be delivered to Indonesia in early July with a total of 100 units. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia continues to work with the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. aid in Jakarta in regard to details of the shipments of the ventilators. And then from ABC News question regarding Australia's support of Australian dollar 6.2 million through WHO for Indonesia, colleagues, this cooperation program was raised by the Australian Prime Minister, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, during the phone call with President Joko Widodo last Monday. Of course, we will work with Australian uh, colleagues and also with WHO to follow up the discussion between President Jokowi and Prime Minister Morrison. And then a question from Moroccan Press Agency on the latest development of Indonesia's international cooperation and the fight against COVID-19. As per yesterday, Indonesia has collaborated with 116 international partners, comprising of 11 countries, 12 international organizations, and 93 NGOs. We have also facilitated international business-to-business -business support for 15 entities. On the question of by ABC, Kyoto News, CNA, and Moroccan Agency on the travel bubble, I think I have touched upon the issue of the essential travel bubble in my briefing. And then next, I would like to respond to Voice of America and NHK related to issue of South China Sea. Colleagues, I always mention that with regard to the position of Indonesia, I think it is crystal clear. I have mentioned the position of Indonesia on the issue many times in my previous briefings. What I would like to add is that Indonesia sent a second diplomatic note to the UN on the 12th June 2020. This note 
wished to respond China note on the 2nd of June on their request for negotiation and consultation. The second note of Indonesia is basically to further reiterate our consistent position that under UNCLOS 1982, there is no such overlapping claims. For this reason, there is nothing to negotiate. Another question from Voice of America on Indonesia's strategy to reduce tension possibly emerged from Israel annexation. What I could say is that, you know colleagues, Indonesia has untiringly mobilized support of the international community to work together to prevent the annexation from happening via international meetings, telephone conversation, letters, and any other avenues. I'm very glad to observe that positive responses from countries, from many countries that I received so far. The U.S. Secretary General have also replied my letter, underlining his shared concern on the urgency to prevent the annexation as well as the importance to achieve a negotiated two-state solution in line with the UN resolution, international law, and bilateral agreement. If the world is really united to support Palestine, I'm sure this united support will give an impact to Palestine. And then, question from NHK and People's Daily China related to agenda of ASEAN summit next week. Colleagues, today we have yet received the official agenda of the summit. As we know that based on the previous practices in the ASEAN summit, we usually have agendas pertaining the ASEAN community building, external relation and future direction, and exchange of views on regional and international issues. So these issues will be discussed in line with the Vietnam Chairmanship team of Cohesive and Responsive. So Cohesive and Responsive is the team of the Chairmanship of Vietnam. This agenda cover all issues that needs to be discussed by our leaders regarding progress of ASEAN community building, partnership with ASEAN dialogue partners, as well as to discuss recent developments of common concerns at the region and the global stage. Due to the pressing matters of COVID-19, I'm sure that addressing the pandemic will be a high priority agenda for ASEAN summit. Next, I would like to respond to a question from CNA Digital, and American press agency, in regard to the latest update on travel restriction for foreigners to Indonesia. Again, colleagues, I have addressed this question several times, but let me re-emphasize that these policies are temporary in nature and are subject to further evaluation based on the development of the situation. My next response is for QB News on question regarding the latest development on the border in the Himalayas between China, Chinese and Indian troops. Colleagues, this is a long historical border issue between the two countries. Both China and India are close friends of Indonesia and are key countries to maintain peace and stability in the region. In regard to the latest development, Indonesia calls both countries to exercise restraint and create conditions conducive for dialogue and peaceful settlement of dispute. Good and productive relations between China and India are in the best interest 
of all countries in the Indo-Pacific region and in the world at large. Another question from Kyodo News on the latest development of the Inter-Korean Lazong Office in the North Korean border city of Kaesong. Indonesia emphasizes the importance of peace, stability, and prosperity in the Korean Peninsula and in the wider region and calls all countries to contribute in maintaining peace and stability. And then we can ask post question about the Indonesian crews at the Chinese prison vessel, in particular Indonesian government action, government, um, in particular Indonesian government action should China show unprogressively response. Colleagues, while Indonesia continues to communicate with our Chinese counterpart, at the national level, we also continue to carry out legal proceedings and investigation. We have arrested eight people responsible for the sending Indonesian prisoners to the Chinese prison vessels. And we hope the result of our investigation will be useful to undertake further legal proceedings in China. Indonesia Foreign Minister, uh, Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs stands ready to facilitate cooperation between respective legal enforcement agencies through mutual legal assistance mechanisms. And lastly, on the question by American Press Agency on the latest report of COVID-19 related to the foreign community in Indonesia, what I could share with you that as per yesterday, there are 321 positive cases, 321 positive cases, 9 deaths, 210 have recovered, 488 are ODP, or people under monitoring, and 265 ODP foreign nationals have been repatriated. So colleagues, this is all from me, and now I would like to invite Professor Liku. Kami persilahkan Professor Liku. Uh, good afternoon, Her Excellency Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ibu Retno, Her Excellency Minister of Manpower, Ibu Ida Fauzia, esteemed colleagues, foreign correspondents, and distinguished Indonesian journalists, uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to give updates and share the latest development on the COVID-19 uh, response and mitigation in Indonesia. And most importantly, what we know so far about the virus and how best to cut the transmission. Our knowledge is far greater than we started the response three months uh, ago. Within around 100 days, we have done our best to find ways to best protect 270 million Indonesians and collaborate with all our friends across the world, stopping the virus. Our best uh, may not be enough, but I assure you that we will not stop, not now. Many of us in the task force, especially Pak Doni Monardo with the backup from the President Joko Widodo, and the two exceptional women, Ibu Retno and Ibu Ida, who I have the honor to share this podium, has no intention to stop battling the virus. However, we may come up with a tactic. We are now in the phase where we must find the best ways to coexist with the virus. Our scientists across the world are racing to find a vaccine and cure for COVID-19. Thousands of studies have been done and been 
submitted to be reviewed by the World Health Authorities, such as WHO and also CDC Atlanta. Indonesia Ekman Institute has also contributed in mapping the virus genome and sharing them with the world. And Indonesia is a member of the country of the Solidarity uh, Trials. We agree that uh, there is no trade-off between health and economic uh, well-being. As a nation, in accord to Undang-Undang Dasar 1945, we must uh, protect both sectors to ensure our people's uh, well-being. Therefore, in carrying the plan to revert productivity, the National Task Force has carefully stratified productive activities in regard to scientific indicators. These indicators will classify the sectors according to the risk of the transmission at work and its economic impact and values. Subsequently, we will determine what measures should be taken in each respective uh, class. Surely, this will require uh, strong collaborations between national and local task force alongside with respective authorities and all businesses uh, corporation stakeholders. This is the spirit of Kotong Royong, or collective collaborations. This is the cure of a series of crises that Indonesia has faced, including the COVID-19 threat, which is our cure in national unity. Now I'm going to answer questions about tests, treatment, data, and mitigation measures. Uh, a question from ABC, SMH, New York Times, and also Nikkei. Indonesia is entering a new normal, but their number of new cases keep rising. Is this not worrying? Should new normal be reconsidered? If not, what more can be done to reduce spread of the virus? Will you? conduct testing or contact tracing for crowds in station and malls. Uh, uh, carefully heading towards a productive and safe from COVID-19 society, a collective behavioral change within the whole nation in assuming the health protocols is essential. The global phenomenon are being coined as the new normal. Well, in Indonesia, we have our own strategy in reactivating the productive activities. As Indonesia is still grappling with the outbreak, we have seen tremendous efforts from all parties not backing down by the viral threat. Some regional authorities have decided to lift up certain restrictions gradually with regard to health circumstances. In the last few weeks, we have seen numerous yellow zones transform becoming green zones. While this is relieving, good news from some parts of our county, our work won't stop nor slow down. As restriction ease, mobility increases, and thus we are aware it could raise the possibility of virus uh, transmission. Currently, we are monitoring the increase of the COVID-19 case numbers, especially in areas that have decided to gradually lift restriction. As I said last week, new cases could be related to the active case findings that the local government had been conducting and testing capacity optimization. So this is a good sign. We also have closely coordinating with all ministries within the task force of the institution so that each sector is obliged to implement strict health protocol based on the risk status of the region. These colored based zones are classified based on public health indicators that is recommended by the WHO. We have also improved testing capabilities which are designated for people who need to be tested. Among those are close contacts of confirmed patients. As of June 17, the number of the specimens testing reached 
19,757, the number is closely approaching the target of the President to increase the test capacity up to 20,000 specimens per day, testing people who need to be tested. Once again, don't expect Indonesia or other countries to get many cases. We need to avert our focus to prevention, not racing toward certain peaks or trajectories. It is about a mindset. The world needs to set an example of great public health indicators and behavior change from each uh, country. Moving on the next list of questions, as part of active global members, Indonesia contributes diligently in numerous collaborative research with other nations alongside with WHO in the agenda tackling COVID-19 uh, pandemics. There are two avenues that Indonesia is currently pursuing in parallel. The first avenue is through our own national effort by establishing a national consortium consisting of multi-stakeholders collaboration. Using the pentahelix approach of all components including government, academia, media, society, and the private sector. The second avenue is through international collaboration in vaccine development and production. We are a big nation and our main goal remains to establish self-sufficiency in the health industry, the protection that we built now, combined with learning from developed countries, will protect not just us, but also the world. The second question is from ABC, Kyodo, and also Xinhua. How has the vaccine developed so far, especially the cooperation between Korea and Kalbi Pharma and between Indonesia and China? We have received the news that our collaboration research with Korea has gained approval for clinical trial phase 1 and 2A last week, 11th of June 2020. The clinical trial phase 1 will be started this month in Korea and Indonesia will take part in performing the second phase, currently arranged to take place in August. The second phase of research plan to take place in Indonesia will all together probe evidence whether the vaccine is efficacious towards the local transmission strains. We look further to cultivate enrichment of scientific knowledge toward the nature of the disease, identification of variant uh, genomic strains of the virus, as well as drug, vaccine and treatment development. All of the components, especially research, help each other to solve this uh, prior issue and still enforce patient safety and scientific principle. The third question is from Kyodo News. Have you decided the date for the phase three of clinical test of a vaccine candidate, which is developed by Sinovac and Biopharma to 1,620 Indonesian volunteers? How soon will the vaccine candidate be produced if the results of the clinical test prove consistent both in China and Indonesia? For the time being, the vaccine that uh, Sinovac and Biopharma have been developing has passed the first phase of clinical trials. The second phase, which is immunology testing, is on its way. The result is anticipated to be announced in the late uh, June. The third phase is planned to be arranged in July next month. The target of the vaccine productions is to embark in the late of 2020. Indonesia Biopharma joins hands with uh, Sinovac because not only Sinovac Biotech is already approved by the WHO, but it is also willing to team up both in vaccine research as well as in the transfer, uh, transfer of vaccine technology. The fourth question is from Kyodo News. 
of the five combinations of drugs to cure COVID-19 patients, how far is the progress before you can use them to patients? I have to explain that Erlanga University researchers reported to us that the five regimen combinations drugs are still undergoing preclinical research in cultured cells, so-called in vitro, and also in animal trials, so-called in vivo study. In the medical world, every novel potential drug must undergo several compulsory stages of study in order to be validated as drug compatible for human use. The research in Erlanga University have conducted so far are the two initial phases of the research staging. After in vivo and in vitro studies, the drugs need to be studied in human clinical trials in order to examine the safety and efficacy in human for specific particular disease. They are now proceeding to the next step, the clinical study in which the drug will be testing on humans in order to measure the drug's safety and proper optimum uh, dosage. To enter the clinical study, they have coordinated with the BPOM, the National Agency of Food and Drug Control, to get the protocol for the planned clinical study reviewed. I hope this statement will clarify what uh, has been uh, reported to the news lately. Without passing the clinical study, any drugs cannot acquire a legal marketing authorization. We do not endorse the use of drug regimens that haven't passed the whole clinical trial. So, there is a great deal to be done, but we hope the best for us. The fifth question from Xinhua. How does Indonesia respond to the Chinese white paper? What lesson can Indonesia draw from the document in fighting COVID-19? How does it work to help Indonesia in preparing the new normal? As the pandemic is nothing like we have borne before, there isn't much that we acquaint about the novel virus when it first emerged. Neither the knowledge about the nature of the virus nor the best strategy to respond to it is known vividly until today. Thus, of course, lessons learned from other countries become tremendously important to be taken into deliberation. We always try to keep up with the ongoing progress of other countries approaching in mitigating COVID-19, such as from Korea, Japan, and also China. In regards to our response toward COVID-19 white paper published by China, we frankly that yet from the open source we conceive that this is one of china effort to elucidate facts and figures about progressive situation in china since they won in the timely uh, manner we think that such disclosure would help to enrich apprehension toward covid 19 and the health crisis it incurs however we still need to look at it thoroughly, bearing in mind that Indonesia might have different nature in some areas compared to mainland China. Any given recommendations from external parties will be examined and assessed in terms of relevancy, feasibility to be implemented in Indonesia. This is all of the questions for today and distinguished colleagues, foreign correspondents, and Indonesia uh, journalists, we agree that good news is good news. Our third of our confirmed patients recovered. This is good, Alhamdulillah. Millions of our farmers and workers go back to work in good shape. This is good, Alhamdulillah. And yesterday and today, Bloomberg say that Indonesia rupiah is emerging at the most attractive currency, Indonesia managed to orchestrate a coordinated effort between Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank 
an early stage of the epidemic, communicating a realistic action plan, Bloomberg says. So I should say Alhamdulillah as well. Still, Indonesia children, adolescents, and women are at the most at risk both of COVID-19 rampant spread and economic crisis. This is not good, but God loves us even more. We are blessed with women leaders who warn us, the men who work with them in policy formulation, in coping with this pandemic, to consider the most at risk in our equation. As mandated by the SDGs, no one should be left behind. The backbone of COVID-19 mitigation in Indonesia are women leaders, including our leaders of big data integration, Dr. Dewi Nur Aisha. We are hoping to conduct a more in-depth analysis discussions of COVID-19 data with the public and the media. Please look uh, forward to it. To Ibu Retno and Ibu Ida and Ibu Sri Mulyani, who managed to keep the economy agile, thank you. To all the women leaders of the world today, including you women reporters, editors, producers, journalists, thank you very much and thank you for leading us. And thank you. I would like to return this to Ibu Retno. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Wiku, and thank you very much for the nice word, especially addressing to women. And thank you very much also, Minister Fauzia. Colleagues, once again, thank you very much for joining in the press briefing uh, today, and see you next week. Bye-bye.